Good morning to everyone that's gathered us. Just as a reminder, if there's anyone new on, this is Lisa Hurley with York County Development Corporation and welcome to our York County Community Briefing. And we will get started this morning with Laura McDougall from Four Quarters Health Department. Laura. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to start off with uh, public health report here. And I, I'm happy to say, um, I think York County is looking a little bit uh, rosier than it was last week. So I, I think I have some, um, at least some pretty good news for York County this week. Um, just going first starting with Nebraska statistics, we are looking at a total case number of close to 35,000. Uh, COVID cases through the duration of the pandemic and 399 deaths. Um, looking at our four corner statistics, we are, um, so two weeks ago, um, I, since we only have this every two, this briefing every two weeks, we had uh, 46 cases in that week that was two weeks ago. And last week, we only had 40 cases, which is a decrease of, four, of six oh, cases over here. No. Um, we, we are... Um, hey, Laura, hold on just a second. Your screen went black on my end. Can you hear me okay? There you are. We have no audio. We have no audio, though. Okay. I can hear fine. Laura, we can hear you. Okay, yeah. good. All right. Is it back, Lisa? Is it back? You need to mirror your screen. Oh, hold on. My screen went away. That's the problem. I'm gonna Thankfully, get... someone else is in the room. <laughs> What's behind me? There we go. Okay. So, okay, there you are. Sorry about that, Laura. No, 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 that's fine. All right. Okay, so um, looking through um, <clears throat> the statistics, um, York County was a was a, a nice contributor and had a, quite a decrease in cases from two weeks ago. I think there was somewhere in the vicinity of like 14 or 15 cases two weeks ago, York County. F only five cases in the last week in York County, which is helping our overall district numbers. Uh, go down. We are seeing um, a surge of cases up in Butler County. They had 19 last week. Hope County had one case, but it was a death of COVID-related illness. Um, Seward County had 15 cases. So York's doing pretty well in comparing at least to other counties in our district. Um, we did have uh, four hospitalizations last week. Three were in Butler County and one was in York County. Um, just talking about the thing that is uh, really affecting our risk dial right now that when we do our metrics for just the risk associated with COVID is uh, our positivity rate, um, which is basically it's, the, it's all based on the number of tests that are done and the number of positive tests. So it's it's a, it's a fraction that's the number of positive tests divided by the total number of tests done. And we, we have been figuring that for our district over these last weeks. And so two weeks ago, it was at 10.61, and which is, we really don't wanna see it above 10. It has implications for our uh, long-term care facilities and, uh, it's just a, a very, it, we'd like to see it l less than five, to be honest. Um, so um, this last week, it was at 13.69%. So it, it's continuing to rise. And that just means that we um, have the same number of tests that have been positive and uh, maybe less tests being done. So there's less negatives to balance it out. So um, we are going to, that was, so those are like, that's the trend in the past where we are figuring our past weeks today for, um, for the past seven days. So that'd be August 27th through September 2nd. And we are going to be providing all of that information to long-term care facilities. They have to, in the future, base some of their testing on positivity rates. And the higher the positivity rate for the county, 
the, uh, the more they have to test, which um, gives us a real incentive to hopefully um, keep that positivity rate down and, and we, we're gonna have to figure out how we best do that. I um, wanna talk just a minute about the directed health measures. There is a new directed health measure out as of September 1st. Um, it is really, we are just remaining in phase three until about the mid, about mid-September, at which time we believe probably the phase four directed health measure is coming. Um, there is a, a one change though that has happened is that schools and, and uh, our schools might talk about this a little bit, but that some of the school personnel, the school staffing, um, those individuals, there are going to be some exemptions for them to be allowed to work while they're in quarantine. So um, I'll let the schools talk about that. Regardless of what phase that we're in, um, in terms of directed health measures, I just like to take a moment and just reiterate and, and just keep reminding people that this isn't going to really change our public health recommendations at all because we um, still are going to have to uh, work on keeping this virus at bay. We, have, um, we still have significant um, pockets of virus around and they, it just moves around and it's looking for people who are not, um, that are there's susceptible and might be exposed because um, we know that this virus, it, it can be quiet one week and it can be, we can have a, uh, an outbreak somewhere the next week. So just reminding everybody, no matter what phase we're in, um, we're still, this virus is still here. We want to remind people to um, still do your social distancing and keep that, dis that physical distance between you and other people when you're out, keep washing your hands. Um, we still recommend that people wear face coverings and masks, it's so important. And if we had more time, I'd tell you some stories about um, how we're seeing it really um, keeping down uh, numbers of cases in schools where the masks are being used. It's, it's pretty impressive, I think. And we know that masks work, so um, keep wearing your masks. And also, if you have symptoms, especially if you have any symptoms that look like COVID symptoms, we really do encourage people to go get tested so that we know what we're dealing with and we can um, block and tackle those uh, pockets of illness that are around and, and hopefully um, keep it from spreading and we can you know, then stay in phase three or four and keep going. So um, those are my updates for today. And I'll uh, pass the ball back to you, Lisa. Thank you very much, Laura. And next up is our um, help, our medical sector. Uh, Jim, are you available this morning? Yes, I am. Uh, I have a few things to talk about and they'll feather in a little bit with what Laura's talked about and uh, testing capabilities. We continue to have the, the same testing mechanisms we've had recently with the, the Abbott, uh, Abbott instrumentation, the ID now, the rapid testing, and that is, that's more of a governmental owned uh, instrument. So we have to uh, uh, adhere to those rules of having symptomatic individuals, but that makes sense anyway, because it's not geared to be as sensitive of a test, meaning that if people come with out symptoms, it's not going to be sensitive enough to, to uh, potentially pick up a, uh, a positive. And, uh, and so that's where the outpatient drive-through testing for symptomatic individuals is also available. And that is just a, a better overall uh, uh, reliability test uh, for those with less symptoms. And, uh, uh, and then test Nebraska, of course, on Wednesdays as well. So our outpatient testing continues overall with 48 tests conducted over the last seven days. And these tests resulted in two positives. And then the week before we had 51 tests through the outpatient and that resulted in six positives. Um, so, and last Wednesday, the, not yesterday, the week before on Wednesday, we saw 72 individuals through Test Nebraska. This week, the numbers dropped to 28. 
and Laura, we had talked about how that's dropping across our district a little bit too. Uh, most of the tests conducted uh, by a long shot really uh, in our drive-through have, have been more of the ID now tests. And so that is very helpful in our turnaround, quick turnaround. Uh, but just as noted as of the last couple days, whether it's Test Nebraska, whether it's our drive-through, uh, it's uh, we've noticed more uh, school kids coming through testing, and and they're and it's and I'm sure it's a product of the algorithm, and they are and they're just not sick. Some of them just have allergies, uh, and some had allergies for years, things like that. So I don't know when some of our ongoing process improvement if there's some things we may need to look at down the road for the algorithm to tweak it a little bit to see if we can improve that. I know Laura saying that and Mitch, that'd be a really hard thing to do. I don't know how you do that, but it's, but that's what we're starting to see is a lot of individuals that are coming through, a lot of kids that are coming through that just aren't sick. And um, so uh, switching gears to the new guidelines coming out from CMS is uh, uh, for nursing homes that Laura talked about there are lots of details that are becoming more and more clear as it comes about. As uh, Laura mentioned, that if you get over 10%, it's twice a week testing at our nursing homes. And uh, But some other piece that's coming clear to Laura, I don't know if you've heard of yet, you probably do know this, but we're required to use CMS published data on the, um, the by-county positivity rate. And the latest one published is 813 to 817, so it's a half a month off. And so the one we're dealing with right now is a 10.3% positivity rate. So as of today, we are supposed to be testing twice a week. Here's the little, not little, here's a big issue that we have and I bet others will have. Uh, you have to meet a 48 hour turnaround on testing. Test Nebraska is being suggested as not being an option on, uh, on phone calls that Jay Colburn's been on. Uh, and also, if we were to go to PLS labs, uh, uh, which we do for our drive-through testing, we've talked with them and the fear is, is that if we put, in our case, it'd be 230 tests per week if we tested all of our uh, 130 employees at the Hearthstone, uh, that would probably prevent them from being able to make the 48 hour turnaround as well. And we've looked at a couple other options. So we are right now just about ready to throw up our hands and say we don't have options to meet that. Now, we, I bet, will not be alone and at all. There's other you know, nursing homes in our county. Uh, there's uh, some other long-term care or post-acute environments that are having to deal with some of the baseline testing as well. So um, uh, I didn't know, Laura, if you knew those other kind of nuances that we're dealing with now as we look to put this into place. But aside from that, the hospital nursing home assisted living restrictions are staying the same as they are right now. P PPE overall is okay. And for the Hearthstone, we're keeping a close eye on making orders to, uh, making orders to ensure we have enough supplies because this, uh, this new CMS regulations would certainly have an impact on that as well, on overall testing supplies and things like that. Uh, so, and over the past few weeks, we have had some positive COVID patients in our facility. You alluded to one, Laura. I know there was a, at least one the week before too, and um, and just wanted to make sure everybody knew that we were able to keep these individuals in our isolation rooms and and on separate side of the floor, you know, of our different our patient wing, um, you know, from if we have mothers and babies and things like that. So they're not anywhere close. And of course, they're transferred out as they typically are if their condition worsens because there is capacity at a, at a state level for, uh, you know, particularly in Lincoln where we would go uh, for those COVID-19 patients if they need a vent or an ICU or something like that. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude my comments and uh, I do need to jump to another call that's starting in about a minute here. So I appreciate it and everybody have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Are there any other medical sector personnel on the call this morning? Okay, 
Then let's go on to our education system. I know Mitch is on. Do you want to kick us off? Sure. Good morning, everybody. Uh, quick report from York Public Schools. Uh, we continue to have a, a great start. It's hard to believe that you know, we're heading into a, a long weekend already, uh, but that's, that's a good thing. I'm really proud of our students and, and teachers. Um, all are doing a great job. We've had uh, great cooperation uh, from our students when it comes to masks, and, and I'll talk about a couple of examples that Laura was alluding to, um, and we really appreciate that. We were actually anticipating almost the opposite uh, when, it, when it came down to it prior to and we're just really proud of our kids because uh, we, we knew this a long time ago. Kids are resilient and they, they're flexible and they change. Uh, sometimes even um, they adapt a little better than adults do, uh, I think, which we all know. But, uh, you know, we're really proud of them. Uh, we've had a couple issues here and there. But uh, as Laura alluded to, um, and this is just a rough estimate by me, um, you know, we've had, we've had a couple positive cases here and there. We've utilized four corners with the contact tracing. Uh, we have had to send out some low risk exposure letters uh, to families and just to make sure we're doing a great job communicating of that possible exposure. I've had some great feedback from families um, uh, about that. Um, so we're, we're, we're happy with that communication. Um, but you know, we, we had a situation in our high school where I, again, just a rough estimate is that if we would not have mandated masks, um, you know, we had a we had a student that you know was in school with a mask on, asymptomatic, and you know we're estimating you know if that student would have had 20 students per class, um, that student has seven periods, and so you can do the math there. Um, I don't know that all you know 140 students would have been quarantined. Um, but my guess and assumption based off of what I know about the quarantine process and the contact tracing process is that there, there's a very good number of those students that probably would have been quarantined uh, just because the nature of a classroom, uh, there's, there's uh, in many situations, there's no way that we can uh, truly uh, social distance by six feet. Um, and so that's why we have masks on. Um, and, and so I think there's one situation right there, as I've told our Board of Education, that I believe the masks have been a, a great decision, um, no matter the controversy or opinion uh, behind them. Um, switching gears, we've been, we've, our kids have been to several activities, uh, sports related, non-sports related. Um, that was one of the uh, uh, issues that was making us a little bit nervous in many other schools as well. And, and we, we've had no issues uh, whatsoever, uh, at least at this point. And so my fingers are crossed there. Um, I'm also hearing too, uh, you know, uh, if you're watching the news, uh, you, you probably heard that OPS uh, did cancel uh, fall activities. And it, it's sounding like they might be reconsidering that. I, I did hear last night, they called a special board meeting here for in another week. So it, that might be interesting to see what happens there. Uh, again, I, I have I have my own issues, and so I try to stay out of their, their problems. So um, we do have homecoming week coming up next week. Um, unfortunately, we did, we felt like that there were some traditional activities that um, we just needed to evaluate and ultimately decided to cancel. Jason Heights has done a really good job of using a student group to um, talk about some of these issues, get their opinion. Um, and, and so a student group was involved in these decisions. Um, and so going into next week, just, just know if you have kids in the system, especially at the high school, uh, there is a, traditionally there is a, a bonfire pep rally on Wednesday night that has been canceled. Uh, traditionally, there's a spirit walk on Wednesday afternoon that has been canceled. And uh, the one that the kids are most bummed about is, is we have a dance on Saturday night and, and that's been canceled as well. Hate to do those things. Those are, those are the fun things that kids, you know, remember from high school. Um, but as Jason talked to those kids, you know, our number one goal is to keep kids in school and to keep schools open uh, because we understand the impact that if we have to close school, 
there are many people, your names that I can see on here that have kids and you would, you know, uh, that would have a definite impact on, on your companies and, and your work and, and those type of things. So again, we have, a, we have eliminated some things that we consider non-essential and I understand opinions vary on what's essential and what's not. But uh, we feel like that we're, we're taking kind of each situation uh, one by one and evaluating whether to have that or not. Uh, the last thing I'll end with is Laura uh, did uh, refer to the new DHM. When I heard about this new DHM late last week, I was, I was pretty excited about that. I didn't know the details, uh, that type of thing. Um, on the surface, it sounds great. On the surface, it sounds like, hey, as an educator, we're not going to have to worry about the possibility of uh, teachers or staff, you know, quarantine due to just exposure, um, which is great. On the other hand, there are a number of different situations that are being talked about, debated, and so on at this point in time. Um, with with that DHM. And so just yesterday I spent I spent about an hour and a half on a Zoom with, well, it was over 30 uh, superintendents or as my former boss called us, stupid intendants and uh, um, uh, several school attorneys and so on. And so, yeah, we just, we talked about all the issues that the new DHM uh, could possibly bring. Um, I have talked to Laura about, you know, some of these exposure situations that uh, we would be very nervous about uh, to bring a staff member in, those type of things. So um, I, I don't have a great answer for the, the new DHM as, other than um, I, Laura and I agreed we're going to take it case by case and we're just going to make a, a sound decision based on common sense and science and, and uh, the recommendation for the, from the medical field. So um, in other words, things are going great. I appreciate all the support. I've had a lot of emails, texts, and phone calls. Uh, we do appreciate that. Um, but again, our number one goal is, is to keep, schools, keep our schools open and keep our kids and staff safe. Thanks and have a great day. Thank you very much, Mitch. Brad, are you still on? And if so, do you want to do an update? I am. Good morning. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, as always, Mitch covered most of everything, so I could say ditto and be quiet, I think. But um, we, we are still blessed to not have a single quarantine case uh, related to our school yet this, this year. Um, our kids are doing great. Um, still wearing masks even though they're not required and um, we're not allowing much for visitors or anything in our building at this point in time but uh, with the new DHMs coming out and the change this uh, week we are going to try to expand a little bit and allowing our student body uh, more access to our activities if we have space. So we're not going to take space away, uh, but one of the ideas that we had was to move all, like all of our kids down to the uh, end zone, for example, and, and do a blanket and lawn chair type of thing uh, just for the student body and then keep track of who shows up so that we have a list, but that'll pull all the kids out of the bleachers and make more room in the bleachers. Um, it'll be fun for the kids as well. And uh, we've been operating on where you've had to have a pass in order to buy a ticket. So we set our maximum number, we printed up that number of passes and you have to present one of those at the gate in order to buy a ticket. And that way we know name, phone number and how many people walk through the door uh, without having to turn anybody away unless they don't bring their pass, obviously. Uh, and that worked pretty well the first week. We only had one person at each event that um, did not have it with them um, and one of those was local so they just ran home and got it the other one I think mumbled some praise for our school district when they left I'm not I didn't quite hear it but I'm sure that's <laughs> <coughs> and uh, uh, but it's gone, gone really really well so our homecoming is actually after the anticipated change of the DHM at the 14th so <coughs> we are um, still talking about that, but um, 
you know, parades are allowed and, and the dances and things like that, we may end up doing a masquerade type of dance uh, where they are all in masks um, and make it a little fun for them that way um, without any outside uh, attendance. It would be our kids only no outside dates and things like that. But uh, so those are all things up for discussion. It's, it's like Mitch said, it's a, an ever changing landscape here day to day. So we knew we would be wrong at least through December. And so we're gonna continue on that philosophy and do the best we can and, uh, and make it as painless as we can, I guess. Uh, so far we've, we've been very fortunate here um, the, the part that Mitch said at the end there with uh, quarantine changes for educational staff, yeah, that's going to be, I think, a case-by-case -case deal for us, too. Um, you know, kindergarten teacher's not going to be able to distance very well with people, little people hanging on their leg all day long, um, but a PE teacher probably could. And so we'll, we'll make decisions, if those things come up, we'll make decisions related to that. Um, for me, uh, the way I kind of look at it is that we, I could see, um, you know, hey, I was at a wedding and they think I need to stay home because this person came down with COVID, but I don't have any symptoms. And I really want to come back to work where before we wouldn't be able to allow them to come back to work. This gives us an option to at least do that. Uh, I don't think it would be in our case, forcing people to work. I think it would be allowing people to work. Uh, so that's kind of the way we're looking at it right now, but um, we're, we'll keep preaching the stick with it. Don't, don't get complacent, you know, keep towing the line. Let's make sure we get through this and, and so far so good. A um, few more rumblings in the bushes, uh, you know, the coffee shop and the co-op coffee club and whatever else those, you know, there's a few more rumblings at places like that, but um, it's going well, going well. We appreciate all the information. So. Thank you, Brad. We appreciate it. Now, do we have anyone from your college on that wants to provide an update? Yes, we have an update. This is Emily Lutz with York College. Um, Good morning, we, Emily. Morning. We started class last week. We had our opening day chapel in Levitt Stadium, so we want to be sure to thank Parks and Recreation and public schools for helping us make that possible. It was a really exciting, if not different, start to the school year and for our new president, Dr. Sam Smith. Uh, we have all of our international students are now their quarantine is over. Um, we, as of right now, do not have any positive cases on campus, which we are grateful for. Um, we know that that might happen at some point, so we are trying to be prepared. We do have some students in isolation just out of precaution, but right now everything seems to be going smoothly. We start home athletic events this weekend with soccer. Um, we are allowing some public spectators at athletic events. You can find all that information on our athletics website, which is ycpanthers.com. Uh, there you'll find information for the Freeman Center for Volleyball, which is a little different than the Cornerstone Complex, just being inside versus outside. The Freeman Center is limited to capacity of only 400, but one really big difference for all of our mm -hmm. athletic events is um, we are doing ticket lists or contact lists ticket purchasing. So you can find that information and you can buy your ticket through the athletic website, uh, there again, ycpanthers.com, there's a COVID-19 tab. You just can click that and get the information on how to buy your ticket. Uh, there's still seating in the Freeman Center, obviously. Seating bleachers still out at the Cornerstone Complex. We encourage you to bring a lawn chair though. Um, but yeah, those are the big things from the college. Thank you very much, Emily. Uh, Heather, are you still on from Southeast? Do you have an update for the college? <clears throat> um, nothing new okay. for the college. Just started last week as well. Um, things are going smoothly. I do know um, on a separate campus outside of York, there was a um, exposure. So we do have students and faculty that are in quarantine, but fortunately uh, with things being 
planned. Um, a lot of things are able to still be done online for the students. And so that has really helped just to maintain consistently being able to move forward. So other than that, nothing new, nothing has changed and we're just going to keep plugging away for the semester. Yeah. Thank you very much, Heather. And now we will move on to our local governmental sector. Not, is Randy on? Nope. Okay. I believe, Barry, you can kick us off. Well, I'll, uh, good morning. I'll kick this off and do it rather quickly, actually, because we, I don't have a lot of new things to report. Um, we're kind of just from a city facility standpoint, just holding the course, um, you know, continuing to do the things that we've done um, over the last months that, that we've been able to get back open. So um, haven't had a lot of instances. I know the convention center, Terry said they're doing a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of meetings and a lot of, uh, of other board meetings where people are wanting to social distance. So a lot of that's happened, but they have started to have some bigger events out there too. Um, you know, the, the library, community center, all those are kind of operating and trying to sanitize and do the best they can. So right now, um, right now our facilities are all open and everything's going good. And I love hearing um, the report that York is, uh, you know, that things are down and hopefully it'll stay that way. So with that, everyone have a great day. Thank you very, very much. I know Benedict's on, you typically don't give a report. I don't see any other communities. Um, Kelly, if you want to jump on, otherwise we'll move on to our faith community and nonprofits. Heather, do you have anything from New York County Health Coalition? I don't know if Brandy's on. Yeah, sorry, I was reading an email. Um, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> things have, so with the coalition, New York County Health Coalition, um, we've con continued to see requests come in just to help with COVID-related um, relief. So that's been, um, I, not that it's neat to see, but I'm glad that people are um, reaching out and utilizing resources that are accessible to them. Um, one of the things that's really awesome right now is as of Tuesday, so the first, we do officially have an executive director that has been hired on for the York County Health Coalition. Um, Jake Owens is here. He's rocking and rolling. He wasn't able to make it on this morning. Um, but he will be reaching out to a lot of our partners just to introduce who he is, to let you know um, just some of the things that we're moving forward with to continue supporting the community um, even more with some ideas that he's got to continue helping with relief for COVID. So that's really exciting. Um, I will also say that we do still have face masks. Lisa, I have not gotten them to your office yet, but, but they will get down there. <laughs> so if there is anybody who is still needing um, face masks at their businesses, um, offices, please, please let us know. We do have a bunch that are still available. So other than that, that's the biggest update we have for the coalition. Okay. Thank you very much, Heather. And for those that are listening, feel free to reach out to Jake. I've given this week to kind of settle in, but welcome him back to the community. And, and let's go on to if there's no one else on the faith or nonprofits, I'm going to move on to the business reports. Um, okay. First of all, I have been hearing from several of our businesses that they are struggling to find employees. So if you are looking for a job, you can either check out our website or um, check out any works. Um, indeed, a lot of them are using. You can reach out to Derek in our office as well. He has a good handle of who's looking for what. Um, but that is something we have employers looking for employees. So please pass the word. Um, the other thing is, I don't believe I've mentioned this on our updates, but YCDC traveling offices throughout the county resumed a month or two ago. So if you're out in Benedict, Henderson, Waco, in any of our member communities, and you want to meet with us out there, we're, we're available. The schedule is on the One County, One Calendar. Uh, it's on our website and at several other locations as well. And the next thing I have is we have rescheduled our Adults Involvement Fair from the spring to October 8th. 
And so in that, what we're hoping to do is that those that want to get engaged, whether it's in a community group or a service group or volunteering in one way or another, um, they can explore their options in one place instead of making call after call and trying to figure it out. So if you represent a group in the community that utilizes volunteers or um, wants people to attend your events and you're not signed up yet, reach out to Derek in, my, in the YCDC office. Our phone number is 362-3333 and we will be doing additional marketing to get participants there as well. And the only other thing I have is we're approaching Labor Day weekend. So everyone have a great Labor Day weekend. I hope you enjoy it and you, you just have fun. I'm gonna turn it over to Madonna for her report. Good morning, everyone. I am really far back, but I am very <laughs> short. Um, I will echo what Lisa had to say about a lot of our businesses struggling to hire. Um, they are reaching out to me daily as well. So the chamber office on our website and in our office and in our communication, we have a lot of help wanted posted. So if you are seeking employment or you know someone that is seeking employment, please have them reach out to our office or your county development and we'll be happy to connect them with their new employer. <laughs> um, I'll just kind of end it with, we um, are thrilled to be able to be hosting York Fest. Um, like everything else, it looks a lot different this year. A lot of the organizations that have put a lot of time and effort to make sure they have safe, fun activities for families to comfortably enjoy. So those have been uh, being worked on for several months. Uh, we will have our, um, highlight event on Saturday the 12th. We encourage everyone to register their vehicle if they want to process their vehicle. And if they want to come down and watch, you can also secure a parking pass. I can't say enough how great it was to work with the Public Works Department and the Police Department to put all of this together so our community can celebrate together in a safe fashion. Everybody have a great Labor Day weekend. Uh, I guess the only other thing I have to ask is there any questions? Okay, then enjoy your weekend. We will talk to you in two weeks and have, just have fun. Bye everyone. Hi Laura. I'll be the one who calls and comes on late.